have a series of four layers. Hi, hello you guys. Welcome to yet another vlog where I'll be trying to get some things done. So last week my dog was not really feeling great and somewhere between having to wake up four times at night to take her out, also just being super anxious about her health, spending a lot of time researching affordable vets and also just trying to find any type of vet that will take us in. I didn't really have much time to study. This week things are much better. The baby is feeling great. Thank you for asking. And now I actually have time to sit down and study. So what did I plan for today? I want to do some Greek as well as some Spanish. For Greek, it's probably going to be close master, which is something that I try to do every single day, but I definitely miss a couple of days last week. And I also want to do some grammar studying, which is not something that I usually do apart from the grammar that I learned through my textbook. But I am kind of at a stage where I've received a lot of information about different groups of verbs in Greek, but all of it is kind of scattered throughout my textbook. And at this point, I just feel lost and I can't really say that I understand why and how those groups are different from each other so that's something that I want to try to figure out today and then when it comes to Spanish there's also two things that I want to do the first one is also some grammar I actually don't really study grammar all that much so I don't really know why today is particularly grammar heavy but my accountability partner slash study buddy and I recently started this challenge where we try to focus on learning materials that we have but have kind of been neglected and I have a lot of Spanish books that I haven't even touched and so I chose this book right here which is called Uso de la Gramática Española Avanzado. This book is exactly what it sounds like. It's just basically a little bit of theory and a lot of grammar drills for some advanced Spanish grammar. And in theory, I don't mind doing exercises like that. I don't mind grammar drills at all. If anything, I find them fun, but I do have trouble sticking to one resource and not trying to do a chapter here, a chapter there. So that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be prioritizing this book for the next month or maybe a couple of months, however long it takes me to finish it. And then the second thing is just reading. So last year for me was terrible in terms of my mental health, but surprisingly that also made me read much more than I usually do. I don't even remember how many books I read last year but I already know for a fact that it's going to be much much less this year. And I don't really know why I'm having this problem this year but I've been starting a lot of books and then just never finishing them. And so about a month ago if not more I borrowed this book from my library that is called El Servido del Arquero and because I borrowed this book I had like two weeks to finish it and I didn't finish it in two weeks and then I borrowed it again and now it's my third time borrowing that book and so this time I'm actually determined to finish the book because I also got two other books from the library and those are actual paper books. These are all by the same author by the way so the book that I'm reading which is a novel and these two books which I believe this one is a collection of essays and then this one is just a book on the history of um, books in the ancient world. So all of these three books were written by the same author. Her name is Irene Vallejo. And I actually first heard about her from one of my teachers. I don't know if it happens to you guys, but sometimes I just decide I want to like an author. And then I just like try to get my hands on all of their books before I even finish my first book by them. I don't know, I just want to be a fan. Speaking about books, there's actually one book that I have managed to finish recently and it's this book called Extra Focus, The Quick Start Guide to Adult ADHD by Jesse J. Anderson. And I have known Jesse from Twitter. I don't personally know him, but back when I was a little more active on Twitter than I am right now, I 
would constantly see his tweets about being diagnosed with ADHD as an adult and I would relate to a lot of that. And full disclosure, I have never been evaluated for ADHD. I do have another diagnosis and I've talked about it on my channel already but there's a lot of struggles that people with ADHD have when it comes to just getting things done really that I relate to and since a lot of you guys also have been commenting on my videos saying that you are neurodivergent like whether you're autistic or you have ADHD I thought that since I liked the book and found it helpful maybe it would be a good idea to tell you why I liked the book and what I liked about it. So this was a super long introduction but what I'm trying to say is that while I'll be doing the things that I have planned for today. I will also be talking to you about the productivity tips that I read about in the book and that I found pretty helpful. So there's a couple of things that I found interesting as a person who doesn't really know that much about ADHD. So ADHD basically stands for attention deficit slash hyperactivity disorder. In the book, Jesse talks about how ADHD is not the best name for this condition because it kind of misrepresents what it is and that instead of thinking that people with ADHD have a deficit of attention, it is much more helpful to think of it as not being able to regulate it. Think about all of the things that are happening at any given moment. A neurotypical person would normally be able to pay attention to what is important to them at the moment and then ignore everything else. And that is very hard for people with ADHD because when there's so many things screaming or begging for your attention, your mind just goes crazy trying to pay attention to all of them and failing to really pay attention to anything. So I thought that was really interesting. I feel like I didn't really say that, but the book is basically productivity advice that doesn't always match the advice that you will read in self-help or self-improvement books aimed at neurotypical audiences. But I think one thing that kind of stood out to me and the thing that probably made the book worth reading is not even the accumulation of all those strategies, which are definitely helpful and I'm going to talk about them later in the video. What made the book worth it for me was how he talked about actually using productivity advice. He says that whatever strategy that you find that works for you today might stop working for you tomorrow. And you kind of just have to accept it and acknowledge that there's probably not a single productivity strategy, tip, system, app that will solve whatever problem you have forever. It is much more likely that you will find something that works for you maybe today, maybe a week from now, maybe two months from now, and then one day it will just stop working. And instead of blaming yourself or blaming that thing for not working, you are better off focusing on finding something new that will work for you. And I feel like I've struggled with this personally for so long because as someone who struggles to get things done but who's also pretty ambitious sometimes, I have tried so many different productivity systems, apps, different notebooks. Sometimes things really work. Sometimes that advice really helps for like a week or two weeks and then it stops and then I'm left to question the validity of that advice or that system question sort of my own personal qualities and just hearing somebody else say that you you just shouldn't take these things personally you shouldn't blame yourself you shouldn't blame those people that give you advice just try focusing on finding the next thing that will work for you and then when that thing stops you can either go back to one of those things that used to work for you before or you can again try to find something new was very very liberating to me i don't know Tell me how you feel about it, guys, because honestly, that was my favorite part of the book. I don't think I told you guys what I was doing. I was journaling, basically. I am trying to get into the habit of journaling because I feel like sometimes I get so much input, languages or not languages, I just constantly consume content, information, and I rarely give myself 
time to actually process what I heard or read or watched or maybe my own feelings and yeah journaling is something that I have been trying to do lately so here's what I was doing in that clip but now I'm actually going to start with Greek Here's where one of the strategies that I read about in the book comes in handy. Again, I feel like I am very familiar with a lot of concepts from self-help just because I've always struggled with getting things done. And so as a result, sometimes I would get obsessed with productivity, not because I wanted to do more and more and more, just because I wanted to do things instead of just constantly being in the state of paralysis where you know what you have to do, but you for some reason cannot even like start doing it. And so something that you will commonly hear, and I think there's even a book that is called Eat the Frog or something like that, is basically to start your day with the most difficult, the most challenging, but probably the most important task. I guess the logic in that is that once you are done with that, even if you don't do anything else, you already did the most important thing or the most challenging thing. Or maybe it's also because once you're done with the most challenging thing, everything else would seem easy. But in this book, Jesse, the author, talks about how it actually rarely works for people with ADHD. So he compares the motivation of an ADHD person to a train. So if you think about a train, it's super heavy, it's super big, it's really hard to get it going. So in the beginning, it's really, really slow. But as soon as it starts moving, it will eventually gain momentum to the point where it's actually really hard to stop a train. And so what he says is that instead of trying to do the most difficult thing and probably just procrastinating, doing something else, ending up not doing anything, what you should do is try to build momentum with smaller tasks. And then once you get into that flow, you can start trying to tackle the big ugly tasks so today i am trying to follow that advice and i actually started with the task that i felt like was the least challenging because it was just taking notes from a book and it's also something fun because i got to play with new software it's not really new it's called freeform and it's a free app if you have any of the apple devices but i don't really get to use it that often and today i decided to use it because it's kind of an infinite canvas type of thing and I didn't really know what my mind map was gonna look like by the time I would finish. So that was definitely very exciting to do and I do think it helped me build motivation to do some other things. So I am actually happy that I started this little study session with something that was fun for me. Okay guys, so... Almost 50 minutes later, this is what I have. And I am super happy that I tried doing this because it made everything so much clearer in my head. I think I've told you guys about how I personally have always struggled to keep language notes, any kind of notes really, because I rarely go back to my notes. I'm always much more likely to just go back to whatever source I took the notes from, like my textbook, and look for explanations there if I forget something. But recently I have kind of been trying to experiment more with taking notes. I don't think this is going to be my main or one of my primary ways of studying, but I have been finding them pretty useful. And that's because I basically found my reason to even bother taking notes because before I didn't really have a clear goal of why I was taking these notes. And now I basically only take notes when I need to visually represent something that is complex and that is not represented the way I need it to be represented in order for me to understand. So for example, here you can see that Greek verbs can be divided into active verbs and then passive. And then if you look at the active verbs, they're divided into two groups and each of those groups is also divided into two. And the way my textbook would go about it is they would just introduce, let's say, group A. And then a couple of chapters later, they will introduce the group B1. And then 
A2 maybe. And I would just not really see the difference between the different groups because by the time I would get introduced to B2, I would already not really remember what makes, let's say, A2 verbs a separate group. And so I really, really needed to make something like this mind map or whatever you want to call it for me to kind of understand clearly. And now I think I do. So I just had a call with one of my accountability partners and actually this kind of goes together with one of the tips that you can read about in the book which is body doubling and what body doubling means is basically working in the presence of somebody else so there's just a lot of ways you can do this you can just invite a friend or a classmate to study together you can also do it online there's websites another thing that you can also do is just try to work slash study with study with me videos here on youtube but another thing that i guess adds an additional layer of accountability is actually stating your intentions for that work session that you're about to have prior to starting it so let's say you're doing it with your friend over a zoom call and you've agreed to study for like to work for 45 minutes or something like that so before you start your session it really helps to tell the other person what you're going to be working on and then towards the end of the session you can also update each other on whether you were actually able to do the thing and i think besides doing just that besides body doubling it just also really helps to have someone who is working on the same or similar things as you are and to kind of talk about the problems that you have to talk about your little wins or like the struggles that you were facing i started doing it earlier this year i first got one accountability partner slash study buddy and it's been going great i also relatively recently got another accountability partner and we don't just talk about languages we also both are trying to grow our youtube channels so talking about that is also really helpful because youtube is such an alienating thing like a lot of the times you work alone just sitting in your room even though you're talking to potentially thousands of people and so um, having someone to talk about that with is actually really really helpful and yeah so besides just body doubling i would definitely recommend looking for an accountability partner or a study buddy or just try to do things together with other people Okay, time for me to finally start reading the book. What I am going to be using is a Pomodoro timer just because, as I've told you guys, I've been having a really hard time finishing books that I have started and now I'm trying to motivate myself to have those little reading sessions here and there. In the book, he breaks down all of his advice into four, I think, areas. The first one is motivation, the second one is time, then there's memory and emotion. So when it comes to time, apparently people with ADHD have significant difficulties with estimating how much time things take. He was talking about how sometimes he will avoid a certain task for weeks or even months just because he thinks that that task is huge and it's going to take a big chunk of time and then when he actually sits down to do it it turns out that it was like a 20 minute thing and i've had so many instances in my life where it was actually the case where i would be dreading doing something and i would be constantly like thinking about that thing and having it in the back of my mind like ruining my mood a little bit because i knew that there was this thing that i needed to do that i wasn't doing and then i would sit down and i would use my phone on purpose just to see how much time a certain thing took and it would be like 20 minutes 10 minutes 12 minutes so this is why one of the things that he recommends is using a visual timer and i think i pretty much 
for the most part always have some kind of a timer or a stopwatch or a countdown going on and that is actually generally very helpful i personally find it very helpful not just in order to motivate yourself so like telling yourself oh i'm only gonna work on this thing for 40 minutes and after that i'm done not just because of that but also because if you actually try to track the time it takes you to do different things in the future you will be able to plan your time better and maybe not promise something that you cannot deliver I know for myself, for example, I never try to see how much time it takes me to edit a video. And so sometimes a sponsor would approach me and be like, when can you send us the final video? And I would look at my calendar and I would be like, well, I only need like four hours to edit a video, right? wrong i would give them deadlines based on my estimation of four hours but then in december of last year i actually tried to track how much time it takes me to edit a video and for three videos that i tried to track only editing just the editing part would take anywhere from eight to ten hours and here i was completely sure that i can edit a video in four hours and i was promising something i couldn't really deliver you know i was giving myself in the first place very unrealistic deadlines and then feeling bad for not being able to keep up with them so in that sense i feel like time tracking can actually be really really helpful because it's not just about doing things faster it's not about supervising every single second of your life it's just about sort of trying it as an experiment just to get an idea of how long things actually take you Another thing that I thought was really interesting, and I just recently talked about it with one of my accountability partners, but we talked about how it might be useful to create time-based goals rather than outcome-based goals. An outcome-based goal would be something like, I'm going to write this paper today. These types of goals usually set you up for failure because if you do not know how long things take you chances are your estimation is not going to be correct instead of uh, setting these outcome based goals we should try to maybe set time based goals time based goals would be like i am going to do this thing that i have to do for 20 minutes and so even if by the end of these 40 or 20 minutes you are still not done you can still get the satisfaction of actually completing the goal because your goal was not to get the thing done your goal was to work on it for 20 or 40 or however many minutes right <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to try to tackle a chapter in my Spanish grammar textbook. This one is specifically about verbs of change, which I am kind of familiar with, but I'm sure there's a lot of technicalities that I do not remember. So it's always good to revise those things. And now that I've mentioned revising, let's actually talk about memory. Apparently, people with ADHD struggle with something that is called perspective memory, which is basically remembering to remember about things. So often, I find myself in situations where, let's say, I want to set a goal for myself, or I want to change my lifestyle, or implement a new habit, or something like that. And what I will do is I will come up with a step-by-step -step, very elaborate plan on how to achieve that thing that i want and then what happens is that most of the time if i failed i didn't fail because i didn't want to do it i didn't fail because my situation changed i didn't fail because the goal was not relevant for me anymore most of the time if i fail to stick to a goal that i have set for myself that's because I forgot that it was even a goal for me. It happens to me all the time. Recently, I was trying to make a plan for the next couple of months for my Greek, for things that I want to do. And when I was finishing that plan, I wrote something that kind of gave me that feeling that I've already seen that somewhere. And mind you, I looked through my notebook and I found almost the exact same plan that I wrote a couple of months 
prior to that. I guess I wrote about it, I closed my notebook and I just forgot that it was even a thing. And so that is called perspective memory, remembering to remember things. One of the solutions that you find in the book is just making things that you consider important visual. I actually agree with that and I do use that a lot when I try to prioritize certain things. So for example, the book that I'm working on right now, I'm keeping it on this little shelf that I have on my desk, not on the big shelf, because I constantly want to see the book and be reminded that it is my goal to complete this book and not the other 500 books that I have. But I would say that just put in a sticky note somewhere where you can always see it or just put in the book on top of your desk is not always going to be enough. My brain learns very quickly to just ignore those things. For example, right here behind me, I have the sticky note with some Polish words that I wrote during one of my study sessions last year. So this sticky note has been traveling from room to room apartment to an apartment with me for almost a year at this point, I would not be able to tell you what words are on this sticky note. It's not that I don't know these words in Polish. I do not know most of these words in Polish because I never learned them. Even in English, I would not be able to tell you what kind of words I have here just because I don't remember. And my brain just learned to treat this as visual noise, as just something it ignores completely. And so I would say that it's a good strategy, definitely. It does help sometimes. It also is just good to have easy access to whatever it is that you want to be working on or working with. But also do have some other strategies in place that will help you. For example, something like an app where you can set reminders or alarm clocks, right? Because a lot of the times just using this is not going to be enough. Okay, now close master time. I think I talk a lot about close master on my channel, so it's pretty self-evident what I'm doing at this point. But while I'm doing that, let's talk a little bit about something called success amnesia. Apparently, a lot of ADHD people share this trait, which is basically forgetting all of your successes, all of the good things that people have said about you, all of the times that you did something and you were proud of yourself. And instead, what they do tend to remember is their failures and that my friends leads to imposter syndrome because again people with ADHD have a really hard time remembering their successes and even if they do remember them something that I think is really interesting and that I can definitely relate to that Jesse mentions is that we often dismiss and discount them by comparing them to our biggest failures or you might also think well that was too easy for me so that doesn't count and I just think it's so true people with ADHD I think also tend to be very sensitive when it comes to rejection and so think about it if your selective memory only makes you remember the bad things and then you are also extremely sensitive to rejection it kind of becomes clear why a lot of people with ADHD have really low self-worth or self-esteem and it's really difficult to change those beliefs that you have about yourself and one thing that he suggests doing is something that Jesse calls a smile file a smile file is basically a place where you store all records of your past successes. So for example, one thing that you can do is just set aside some time, sit down and try to think of everything that could be considered an achievement and that you're proud of. Or maybe try to remember the times when someone complimented you on your effort or your intelligence or whatever it is that they complimented you on. For me, for example, I tend to overthink this whole YouTube thing a lot. And so something that I started doing recently to kind of remind myself why I'm doing it and to remind myself that I don't always suck at what I do. It's just taking screenshots of comments that you guys leave. And um, yeah, whenever I feel like I'm doing a really bad job and I actually don't know anything about making videos or anything like that, I can sometimes go, if I remember, again, perspective memory issues, 
But if I remember to go and look at that little folder where I keep all of the screenshots, it definitely makes me feel better. So this is just some of the tips from the book that I personally liked and I thought you guys could benefit from. But in reality, the book has so much more to offer. And if you are interested to learn more about productivity advice meant specifically for people with ADHD, I will leave the links to the book. I also meant to mention it in this video, but I completely forgot. I launched a Patreon last week. If you guys are interested in seeing bonus content from me, there's going to be Notion templates, PDF templates. There's going to be resource recommendations, a newsletter, a podcast that I'm working on right now. If any of that sounds interesting to you, please check out my Patreon. Other than that, things are going to be more or less the same on this channel. I'm still trying to keep to my schedule of one video per week, so you can always expect that here. My dog is going crazy right here next to me, so I'm going to leave you guys for now, and I will see you in my next video. Bye-bye!